Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Paint Desk Rumblings. So, I had planned to have some guests over tonight, but we had to reschedule, unfortunately. So, it's just me by my, my lonesome again. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, it's. Uh, we'll still have a, an enjoyable show, I hope. Uh, so, the topic. For tonight, um, since I had to reschedule, I had to come up with something pretty quickly. So I did, did something that's fairly easy for me to, to do. So it's another fluff focus episode. Last one was uh, that as well. Um, I talked about Tsuandan. Um, but I got some pretty good feedba feedback on it. People seem to appreciate it. So I figured I'd. Uh, Go, go with the flow and just do another. This time a bit, uh, bit bigger of a topic. Swandan is uh, cool and all, but it's uh, it is a fringe part of the Ninth Age world. Eastern nation, literally on the fringe edge of the map, world map. Uh, so this time it's a bit, bit of a bigger topic. It's the, the dark gods. Who are, of course, uh, a group of deities that are quite important to the Ninth Age world. Uh, especially important to two of the main factions of, of the game. The Warriors of the Dark Gods, as the name suggests, and also the Demon Legions. So both of these those factions have their own full book. Uh, and there's also the uh, Circling the Abyss source book. All of them are packed with uh, background material, so there really is a a lot that can be said about these guys. And by no no means I, I won't be covering everything, uh, but I hope I can provide some some basic understanding of what the, what the dark gods are about, basically. So that's what we will be chatting about tonight. Uh, but before we get into that, we have the Hobby Spotlight. And as you can see, I'm working on a war machine. It's a Bolligan for my Empire of Sonstal army. So the model is uh, an older model by Games Workshop. The, the old uh, metal blaster Bolligan. It's out of production since quite a long time, um, but I've had had it. Actually, my, my brother had it in his army, and I've stripped it, uh, stripped it down, uh, inherited or stole his army, I guess. Uh, so I stripped it down, and uh, I'm now painting it up again. Uh, but I converted it slightly. I took some parts from the new Hellblaster Volgan kit and merged with this. Um, it's a multi kit, so you get if you build the the uh, rocket battery that they also offer in that kit, you get all of the hell blaster kits over. So I fused a, a few of them into this uh, this old kit. So uh, I don't know if you can see here, but the, um, the Griffin Hammer thing is here on the back. Uh, strike the ignition basically uh, those are in plastic from the new kit and also the barrels that are separate not attached yet they are also from uh, the new plastic kit so I took the parts that I liked from each kit and uh, made something a little bit of my own uh, I've been painting up the crew earlier today they are over here had a lot of fun with them but now I'm do doing the chassis for the for the war machine, so painting up some wood, uh, trying a new technique, quite liking it so far. Um, I base coated it with the the airbrush, uh, a solid yellow brown color. Then I dry brushed it a little bit to pick out the uh, high points, and now I'm glazing it down a bit to really define all these wood patterns. 
because they are very nicely sculpted on this this old kit. And it's picking up really nicely, nicely. So I'm enjoying that. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on. As always, please put in the comments below what you are working on. Uh, the purpose is, of course, as always, to write some, some background noise for people to listen to while they are painting. So I'd be very happy to, to learn what you are working on. So put those down below. Um, yeah. But we will move swiftly on to the news, I guess. And it's been quite a busy two weeks. I had to uh, to exclude some stuff that has happened because it just turned out to be too much. Excuse me, just some piece of, of, of a pencil bristle that had detached and was in the way, so I had to remove that. So yeah, busy week. Um, we can start with a model release by Norba Miniatures. Uh, the uh, Hero Titan, suitable for the Undying Dynasties, of course. Uh, looks like a really cool model. Um, imposing on that lar small 50 by 50 ba base, so very tall. Um, very strongly e Egyptian themed, so if you have that going in your army, this is will fit right in. So check that out if you're interested, the link will be down below as always. And we will move on to uh, Sigmarite Boutique. It's a Canadian company I think, a one man show. Uh, and basically he uh, does a lot of 3D printing, markers and such. And uh, you can can buy stuff from his uh, Etsy shop, uh, and you can uh, make custom orders for things to print and such things like that. So really cool stuff. Uh, I myself have a 3D printer, so I'm not that uh, much interested in this. But if you don't have a 3D printer uh, but want to have some some unique things printed, this is certainly a good option. So check that out. Uh, next we have a Kickstarter, um, Tor Azur, for some uh, uh, buildings, basically, uh, some elven, iron elvish uh, buildings, and again uh, 3D printing is, is the thing, uh, so he's doing um, 3D printable terrain. You can back it to get the STL files, so you can 3D print, 3D print your own, or you can back to have them printed for you and shipped to you. Um, right now, you can see on the screen, perhaps you can't see, but it says 28 hours, so by the time I get this out, probably around 24 hours left. And it's just about funded, just a little bit to go. Uh, I myself shipped in, uh, what is it, for 14 bucks, I think it's uh, now euro, 14 euro, uh, to get myself one of the of the STL files. Um, so, go check that out if you're inter interested in some Highborn Elfish buildings. Uh, they also support the Ninth Age, I want to mention, they have this little logo down here, so it's always always uh, good to, to support those companies that uh, go out of their way to, to help the project, I think. So yeah, check those out. Uh, next we have some news from the, uh, the project itself. So the cultist book was updated. Um, yeah, I'll I don't know why I'm showing this screen, it's not that important, uh, but uh, anyway, this is the first update to the, the rules since the re release. Uh, quite a few changes, actually, um, but overall quite good ones, I think. Uh, I'll summarize 
some of the most, the most important changes. Uh, so the characters now give out Fearless to the units they are in, which makes, makes it more interesting to put characters and units basically. Um, and there's no longer any uh, any allowance of up to six tokens saved avail tokens in the pool uh, per default as they had before, uh, which I th that was changed. I actually don't really agree, agree with. Could I think maybe they could have reduced it to four or five or something, but re reducing it to six. Feels a re reducing it to three. I don't know. It, it it changes the army quite a lot. I think you need the tokens obviously to to summon demons, and uh, you only have have, have uh, three uh, max available. You can't summon that much. You can address it by taking the manifestation. Is it sorcerer's antenna, perhaps? Uh, on a demonic symbiote and get up to 6 again but uh, it's not exactly what you want to take on this symbiote they are quite fighty normally so you want to emphasize that perhaps rather than um, supporting magic with them basically <clears throat> so I think that's a bit of a shame but um, I'm sure they th thought it through um, they also change summoning a little bit, so now you can summon in the first turn. Previously you can only do it from the second and onwards. But you can only spend, I think, two tokens in the first turn, so you can't summon that much. But this is an important change, um, because previously they had a lot of trouble that they couldn't get any chef in the first turn of the game. So if they faced a, a really pushy army, they could easily be overrun, because they couldn't chaff in the first turn. But now they can, can summon up some chaff and, uh, and do that in the first turn, still. So that's a very good change, I think. Uh, some changes to nomadic items. They have lost one that was quite important, the one that gave you... You could take it on a symbiote to make it into a summoner for one turn basically, which which was pretty cool. That's gone. Instead they have some uh, more new uh, unique ones. They also have some access to some more stuff from other books. Most importantly they have access to the Locket of Suna. Which is credible I think. <laughs> Taking that on one of their uh, cult, cult leaders who is not really that impressive fighter. And suddenly he can he can really threaten uh, any any big character that uh, charges his unit. So that's a cool change. <clears throat> Maybe a bit of an auto include, but we'll see. Uh, they have changed some path access. They have access to evocation now instead of witchcraft. I don't know how to feel about that. I think evocation is a stronger, a stronger path, <coughs> but um, yeah, in the end, I don't think it's super important. At least I can't see it as such. Um, and finally, they have removed frenzy from the basic cultists core unit, and that's a big change because I understand that when you're Playing this, uh, it was a real issue that um, your basic anchor units uh, constantly charged into the enemy because they had crappy discipline. Um, so that was a bit annoying, I guess. So good change makes makes them play more like a normal army, I guess. So yeah, I think that's will that will be appreciated. So yeah, those are, are the uh, changes, broad strokes at least. You can go check it out if you want to. I encourage you to, it's a cool army. Uh, so yeah, go check that out. 
we will move on uh, to a an update on the on the web page. Um, they have a new site for joining the team, or a new page for joining the team. So <clears throat> a bit easier to uh, to get engaged and uh, and help out, basically, which is always good. So if you are interested in, in, in helping the team out in any way, um, go check out that page. The project is always looking for for new recruits to help out with uh, with everything. There's always things to do in every in every part of the project, basically. So check that link out there below. Uh, next we have the Painting League, a summary uh, for the past month month of January. So a lot of stuff that has been painted in in the community. And Blonde Bear summarizes all of that in this neat handy post, so just a quick scroll through. Lots of cool stuff, um, great to see so many people engaged. So yeah, check that out too. Um, and the last bit of news is a competition for Night Scroll, where you can write. I mentioned this in the previous episode, but you can uh, write rules for uh, units um, that have models but no rules, basically. If you know a company that produces some cool mo <coughs> cool miniatures, but there's nothing really appropriate to, to play them as in the game, you can write your own rules and post them here. And the, the best ones will be put into the scroll, basically. So that's, that's cool, I've, I've written a few myself. But they, they were a bit poor at announcing it, so people didn't really know it existed, but now uh, they, they remedied that. So that's good. So that's it for the news. Uh, we will move on to the main segment. And I will clean up some water that I spilled on my computer. <clears throat> so, the Dark Gods. Before we get into them, we have to talk about uh, their, their master, the one they serve. Which is, of course, Father Chaos. And to talk about Father Chaos, we should talk about also his counterpart, Mother, Mother Cosmos, uh, known as the Timeless Titans. <clears throat> so in the Warriors of the Dark House book, uh, there's a story about the Timeless Titan, Titans. Which is basically a a Genesis story about the creation of of the world, uh, and, and it's basically that from nothing, these two beings, timeless titans, were created, and Mother Cosmos, she she created the the mortal realm around her, which is the the normal realm where everybody lives. Um, also known as Earth, uh, and Father Chaos, he, he created the Immortal Realm, which is where the de demons and the Supernals live. <coughs> Excuse me. And Mother Cosmos, she also created the veil, which separates uh, these two entities from each other. Um, and the father tries to get back to to the mother, basically, but she shields herself with, the, with this veil, um, and that's basically the, the veil that uh, that separates the two the two um, realms. Which allows magic to seep through and all of that. 
um, and the father also sends suitors uh, called uh, through the veil which I assume are the demons um, so basically his goal is to, to get back to, to Mother Cosmos and make them one again um, but the way that that manifests in the in the mortal realm is basically just through destruction uh, so yeah that's for the chaos and the dark gods are then a collection of seven seven gods that serve Father Chaos. <coughs> um, exactly when they were created is not really defined, but they, we know that they are have been around for a long time. They are mentioned in the context of uh, of ancient Naptesh. So somewhere around the third age, but probably even before that, they were they were around. Um, there are mention of demons in ages even before that, so yeah, probably. <laughs> so the dark gods, they have these demons that serve them. And that they send to the world to do different things. Uh, and they are also worshipped by mortal mortals in the world. And basically, uh, worship of of dark gods seem to be uh, synonymous with uh, being called a barbarian. So there are, there are parts of the world where they are openly worshipped, such as Oskland and uh, the Makar, Makar Steppe. And several other places, um, and those who do that are often called barbarians by the more civilized races, at least. Um, there's also those who make pacts with the demons, uh, with the dark gods. So they sell their soul to a dark god and gain power in return. These are what we call warriors. <coughs> um, and yeah, that's about it for for the, the whole uh, as the Dark Gods will look through each one specifically. I also want to mention that it is known that the, the Dark Gods, they, they fight among themselves. They are not uh, that friendly with each other, all the time at least. It's mentioned sometime by this uh, Sigmund Selig um, in one of the, the Q&A sessions with him. I can't recall which, which scroll, but uh, it's out there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into each of the Dark Gods. So these are, they have, they have said to have formed themselves around the sins of the mortals. So they have <coughs> specific vices or sins that they, they lure people in with. Uh, who, they wanna people who, who want want to engage in those sins, uh, find uh, uh, freedom and the ability to do so by worshiping these gods, basically. So first up, we we'll do it, do them in alphabet alphabetical or order. So first up is Akan. The god of gluttony. Um, he is also known as the devourer and um, he's pretty popular among, you guessed it, gluttons, people who want to gorge themselves in food and riches and, oh no not really riches, food mainly. Um, his sign is that of a lamprey. We'll switch over to his sign. So this is the icon of Akan. Uh, his colors are browns and uh, brownish greens, basically. Uh, the warriors who worship him have the notable feature that their 
uh, jaw, your lower jaw, often is exposed. They don't have a helmet over that. So that they can eat during battle, basically. They are also often um, swollen and rotten and stuff like that from having eaten too much, basically. Um, not super fond of a con. Not my favorite card. Um, but there's a pretty cool story about him in the Demon Legion's book. Um, each of, of the gods has a, their own little story in the Demon Leader's book that is quite neat. The one about Akan is about the, ta the town that is visited by a nobleman who throws like a huge party and everybody is super happy. And they party all, all day and night and they uh, eat good, good food and uh, everybody is super happy. But then they just keep partying. And they eat everything, all the food stocks, all the animals, the cats, the rats, everything. And then they start eating each other, and yeah, it, it's all just turns turns dark really fast. <coughs> so that's a pretty neat story. Um, the demons of Akan are said to have a unique trait among demons in that they can. Uh, consume stuff of the mortal realm. <coughs> of the mortal realm. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I need a brush that one. <coughs> so that's a con. Uh, we will move on to Sibaresh, the god of lust, also known as the tempter. Uh, Sibaresh is basically the the guy to go to for any of your perverted fantasies and so, things like that. Um, his icon, as you can see here, is basically a a perverted version of the cosmology symbol. So this is the circle in the middle, which is the icon for Mother Cosmos and the Infinity Sign for Father Chaos. Um, and here the Father Chaos part is a bit uh, broken up and replaced with uh, a fork, basically. Not really sure what's meant by it. <coughs> uh, he also has another sign which is a tongue, basically. A bit like, like a Rolling Stone sign. Uh, so his story in the Demon Legion's book is uh, one about a a uh, hidden cult in the barren mountains that uh, allows you to live through any sexual fantasies that you have, basically. His colors are, vi are violets and blue. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about, about him. Pretty, pretty straightforward, I'd say. Um, again, not my my favorite of the gods. Both of these are pretty straightforward, I think. So, we will move on to Kulima, the goddess of envy, also known as the Lady of Flies, Schemer and the Leveler of All. This one is a favorite of mine. Her icon is, uh, as you can see, this uh, fly. Uh, which is pretty catching, <coughs> I think. Uh, her colors are bright green. A green with envy, I guess. Uh, her story in the 
team in Eden's book. It's I think my my absolute favorite story in that book. <coughs> and it's about an elf in Sagarika who uh, starts uh, experimenting with leprosy among humans so manages to develop a strain of the, the disease that spreads to elves which is not usually the case and he uh, infects basically the whole el elven population of the, of the for fortress where he, where he works uh, and it's, the reason for this is that he was never one of the, of the prettier, <coughs> prettiest elves and he was envious of, of other elves who were more beautiful and uh, Kulima allowed him to develop this disease and make everybody ugly. So she is the leveler, leveler of all but not always through lifting you up that she brings everybody down. So I, I like the thought of that. Um, it's, a, it's a very evo evocative story in my mind. Um, the warriors of Lima are said to carry loot from different opponents that they faced. Which again I think is very evocative, you can have a lot of fun. Building models for that, I think. Taking bits from every possible kit and uh, yeah, smashing it together. Um, and her demons are said to be very fluctuating, so they, they don't have a have a fixed form, but rather adopt themselves uh, to what they face and such. Um, yeah, the herd uh, should probably mention demons of each god. Um, so Akan has the, the maw of Akan, and he has the bloat flies. Sibaresh uh, has the courtesan of Sibaresh, and the sirens, and Kulima here has. Lima's Deceiver uh, as the Greater Demon and Mage Black Gremlins as the Lessers. Um, and Kulima's Deceiver, I think, is the absolute coolest demon in the book. So basically, as the shape shapeshifter that, that uh, <coughs> takes the abilities of, of the person they face and turn it like, turn them against them. I think is very cool. So yeah, big fan of Kulima. Uh, we will move on, I think. Um, yes. So next up is Nukuja, goddess of sloth. Another one of my favorites. Uh, she's known as the sleeper. And her icon is this uh, pyramid thing with a with a black eye in the middle. Um, she also has a locust as her icon sometimes, and her colors are mainly white. And uh, her warriors are distinctive. Have White rusted armor, white hair, and pitch black eyes. And the story about Nukuya in the Demon Legions book is not that cool, I think. Probably the, the, the least interesting <coughs> of those stories. Uh, it's about a, a cultist who finds his way to a sorcerer and asks some questions about demons. And she basically recommends uh, summoning demons of Nikoya because those are the least likely to kill you, uh, since they are so lazy, basically. Um, not a super cool story, 
But instead I want to mention a story about Nukuya from the Warriors of the Dark Arts book. Um, about some knights of of Nukuya who uh, encounter a band of uh, red elf slavers. So they, there's just five of the knights, I think, and uh, some twenty elven um, rosars, basically. Infantry, at least. And they just slaughter them. Um, they don't care about the elves at all, uh, or about the slaves at all. Um, so they are basically set free. And then they take, take the elves and they carve out their eyes, which is pretty gruesome. And then they arrange the eyes in a pyramid, and then they sit next, next to that pyramid for god knows how long. So yeah, that's just a very creepy story, I think. Um, the demons of Nukuya are the uh, sentinel. The big owly uh, Madicaster, which is one of my favorite demons, also, and the, the Hope Harvester, um, the great machine cannon thing. So, um I guess that's about it for Nukuja. I should mention that uh, she also is associated with uh, foresight and powers like that. She is said to have seen how everything ends, basically. So she knows, knows how the world will end and things like that. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's Nukuja. Uh, we move on to <coughs> Savar, God of Pride, uh, also known as the Fallen Star or as the Morning Star. Uh, this icon is this um, crown symbol with a downwards pointing arrow. And his colors are uh, regal blues and purple. So a bit similar to Sibaresh, but uh, still different, I guess. Both his demons and his warriors are known to uh, wear crowns. So that's a recurring feature. Uh, And <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, yeah, he's said to be very popular with uh, the elves. So all of the, the the gods are, of course, possible to wor worship by any species. <clears throat> Humans are perhaps overrepresented, uh, but the Savar in particular is said to be popular with uh, elves because they they take a lot of pride in their species basically um, so the war finds a natural foothold there <laughs> um, the story in the D demon legions book about Savar is pretty cool it's about a knight of Equitane who, uh, Encounters, he sets out to kill a demon, a, a demon prince of Savar, I think it, it calls it. <coughs> and he's bested by the, by the demon, he's not able to kill it. But the demon lets him live. He's frustrated with this, so he, he goes out and trains. And he comes back and tries to kill the de demon again, but again he fails. 
and he's frustrated and he goes out and trains and he repeats this a few times times I think. And then eventually he, he starts to trust more in his own ability than uh, his faith and uh, things like that. So basically he's, uh, he starts to take more and more and more pride in his own, own abilities and is uh, eventually turned uh, to worship Avar. So it's a neat story about how even the purest of intentions can be turned against one. Uh, so that one I like. His demons is the uh, Omen of Savar and the Blazing Glories, uh, which are a bit boring in that they are pretty similar, even stated explicitly. Um, but I, I still 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 quite like Savar. <coughs> um, yep. Next up is Sugulag. The God of Weed. So he's a pretty cool fella, known as the Collector. Um, and uh, I guess it's popular with hoarders, people who don't throw throw away things. I guess also pretty much everyone who collects miniature war game gaming miniatures. Uh, would find their place with with Sugulag. We are a collecting bunch after all. Uh, so yeah, his colors are gold, basically, and uh, people turn to him uh, in search of riches, basically. Pretty simple. I very much like his icon. I think it's aesthetically pleasing. Um, story about him, the Demon Legion's book, is about a coin. There's this this uh, guy who turns up at a bar, pays for a, a beer with a strange coin. Having the symbol of of the collector, and then he tells his story to <coughs> the guy next to him. Uh, and apparently, he was a rich man, very successful, but uh, he uh, once encountered a guy. Uh, who wanted to a place to stay stay for the night? He paid paid with this strange coin, and since that day, he uh, this guy became obsessed with um, with greed, basically. Uh, so he, he never wanted to part from any of his possessions. He disowned his own son because he didn't stand the thought of anyone ever getting a hold of his treasure. Uh, and he, he made a lot of money by doing the, being this greedy. But then eventually everything turned on uh, turned on him and he uh, was ru ruined. Uh, and then the, the last coin that he spent was at this bar. This, this coin that he had gotten from the homeless person. <coughs> and now he felt relieved he was freed from this curse uh, and could go back to living a normal life but instead now the bar barkeep was starting to act, act weird and uh, uh, extorting his customers and things like that so it's basically this this coin that just exists in the world and passes on uh, and makes people greedy until they, they get rid of the coin which they don't want to it's the last thing they part from but eventually, when e everything else is lost, they do part from it, and then they are free. But uh, then someone else g gets the coin, and the story cycle repeats itself. So, a very evocative story, in my mind. 
bit like that one. Um, so I guess that means it's time for the seventh and final god. We'll move on to Vanadra, who is the goddess of wrath. She is also known as the Adversary, um, and has been known by the name of Kupach, something like that, <coughs> in ancient Naptesh. Uh, her icon is this angry face, and her colors are red and black. Um, her demons are is the Scourge of Wrath and the Brazen Beast. Um, and I think I forgot to mention the, the demons of Sugulag. So his greater demon is the Miser, a big, big guy of us, basically, and uh, the Hoarders, smaller demons. Um, so yeah, yeah, back to Vanadra. Uh, She has a bit of a focus on injustice and betrayal, so she she uh, acts as punisher for p people who have done injustice and uh, often finds worshippers among people who have have been been wronged and want ret retribution. Um, so in a way, she's a, she's a bit noble, I guess. Um, but of course, a bit extreme. Um, story in the in the Demon Legion's book. It's a really cool one. It's about a lion uh, that is he's angry that that he doesn't get. Um, everything that he wants. The the monkeys, they give him fruit, but he, he doesn't get enough, he th feels. He wants more fruit, and the golden phoenix or something like that has only given, given him one child, and he wants more. Uh, and there was something else that he wasn't happy with. Um, yeah, he doesn't have any friends. He only has a bunch of hyenas <coughs> who follows him, and they just laugh at him. So he doesn't. He's not one of them, really. Uh, and he meets this, meets a cockerel that promise him, promises him uh, all the things he'd want, or this punishment for those who keep the good things from him, if he. He starts worshipping uh, Vanadra, basically. Uh, and so the lion agrees, and he goes out to find the monkeys, and uh, says that I want more fruit, but they don't give him any more fruit, so he kills them. But now he doesn't have, get any fruit at all, so he ha now uh, from uh, now on has to hunt to get food. Uh, and he finds the phoenix. And wants more children, but he doesn't get any, so he kills the phoenix. But now he has to mate with the, the lionesses to get more children. <coughs> uh, and then he finds the hyenas and complains about how bad friends they are. And then he kills them, but now he doesn't have any, any friends at all. Uh, so yeah, Vanadra has help, helped him avenge these 
this misdeeds, but he, he ends up in a worse position than he was. So it, it's a ca cautionary tale, basically. But I quite enjoyed it. Um, so... Yeah, I also want to men mention the, the keep of Dalmagoth, which is a place in hell. Um, all of the gods have a, a realm in hell um, that is uh, explained in this uh, Circling the Abyss book. If you haven't read through that, you really should. It's a good one. Uh, but the keep of the Dalmagoth is, um, is a place, a, 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 a keep in the circle of Vanadra. Um, which is, I think, where she punishes the worst, worst betrayers in history. Uh, so yeah, she she really has a, a thing for for betrayal and punishment for that. Basically, but uh, yeah, I think that's gonna do it. Don't have much more to say about the dark gods. I feel that I rambled on though quite a bit. Uh, perhaps it got a bit repetitive, but <clears throat> that's what it's all, it's all about, ramblings, so whatever. Hope you could find it somewhat enjoyable, at, at least, and get some painting done. For myself, I have finished the wood, and now painting the... Okay, some really weird technical difficulties there. My camera came tumbling down, uh, so yeah, I just wrapped this up. I'm working on the steel now uh, of the chassis. Uh, it's going pretty well. So yeah, I guess that's it. Um, thank you for watching, and I'll see you on, on the next one. Cheers.